We are excited to share our experience with the Sea Wind 1260. It's a modern catamaran. It's a moderate displacement, not light, not heavy. Really a beautiful ride. We're gonna try and dissect it and look for the weak points. Twenty twenty has been quite a year. I think we can all agree. At Starbucks, there's no longer a sugar-free mocha. I'm sad. Can you see this? Definitely keto. There are several fantastic 1260 videos on YouTube. So we're gonna just do a quick tour before we go sailing, and then we'll sit down for a rather detailed review of the things we like and those that we don't. The 1260 is 41 feet long and 22.3 feet wide. The draft with her fixed keels is three feet, eight inches, and displacement is 18,400 pounds. This puts the displacement to length ratio at 119. That's very similar to a Katana 42 and places this boat solidly in the performance cruiser category. Notice there's no headliner, which makes it much easier to clean. The starboard side is the galley. and the guest cabins. The two cabins share a head, which is all the way forward, and this is a wet head. The berths are small, but adequate. And the motors are twin Yanmar 29 horsepower diesels with sail drives. This is the owner's version of the boat. It's a three cabin. Storage areas are adequate, I would say, but on a boat like this, you wouldn't want to overload it anyway. This has got a separate stall shower. She carries 126 gallons of fuel, which should give the boat a monstrous range under power. This is one of the most practical and versatile designs we've been aboard. The build quality is exceptional. Not only are there fantastic design features just about everywhere you look, but the execution is nearly flawless. The base model is $410,000 new, and this particular 1260 is very well optioned out and for sale for $597,000 in the summer of 2020. The sails on this boat were beautiful. They're cruising laminates from Doyle, the main sail is 707 square feet. The working jib is self-tacking and expectedly small at 307 square feet. Sweet. We were able to point to about 45 degrees apparent and the leeway wasn't bad in these light winds. Very similar to a monohull. And most owners will want to get the optional screecher on a sprit. I mean, it's more or less a lake in here, so I mean, we're not really testing it out in real chop, but I'd say it's pretty comfortable. It's it's got fine entry bows, so it's it's kind of slicing on in. It's not necessarily popping up and down all that much. And we're not really hearing much in terms of slap. I mean. It's a relatively sheltered area, but I don't know, for what it is, it seems like a nice smooth ride. This boat also had a asymmetrical spinnaker, 1,238 square feet. So this rig has got plenty of power. How much room do we got here? You guys want to jive it or you got to snuff it before you jive it? Oh, we'll jive it. Oh, we'll jive it. Okay. 
So this is just our opinion. It's just our experience. This is gonna be a review of sorts. It's more a comparison between our boat, a Leopard 46, so we've been cruising for four seasons, and the Sea Wind 1260. And we gotta say right off the bat that these boats were designed for completely different uses. Our boat was designed for the charter trade and can easily accommodate eight people. Mm -hmm. The Sea Wind 1260, it's 41 feet, five feet shorter, and really designed for a couple to operate, maybe a maximum of two couples on board. So really, it's an apples to oranges comparison, but we wanna give you our thoughts. And we have five categories that we're gonna to use to break down our thoughts. We only use the number five. <laughs> if it doesn't fit into five, then we can't do it. It is my favorite number, so that's <laughs> not a coincidence. Lucky number five. The first category is things that we loved that we actually wish Clarity had. The second category is what we'll just call very nice aspects of the 1260. The third one is kind of a, a, a weird category, but it's, it's we're not quite sure what we think. Yeah, I think sometimes people see a design sort of situation and they make a quick judgment about it. We really think you gotta spend a bit of time with some of these issues to see really what works for you and what doesn't. Category number four, I guess you could say these were things that at least at first we weren't super pleased with, but maybe we can get used to them over time. The last category, number five, is the deal killers. So we'll get to those. Number one, things we really loved about the Seawind 1260 that we actually wish Clarity had. The first one is the electric winch. So here we have uh, speed one, high, low. This isn't particular to a Seawind 1260, but either we're getting too old or we're just starting to appreciate having at least one electric winch on board. And I will say the location of that electric winch is right at the helm. So raising the main right from the helm, that would be cool on Clarity. Second in our list of things we really wish that Clarity had, but the Sea Wind 1260 does, are the very large opening front windows. I don't know if you call them port lights or not, but they have got, uh, I don't know, two and a half by two and a half foot opening ports. And with those open, you get a lot of ventilation, you get a good breeze. Clarity could use maybe a little bit more ventilation up front. The third thing that I wish Clarity had were the front bow cushion seating areas. So not a front cockpit, like a walkthrough, but just right on the trampolines, there was a really comfortable couch. We've seen these on a lot of boats. They got a great compromise. It's just wide enough that you can really recline and relax, but it's not so big that you're blocking your trampolines and the wind that needs to come up between the hulls. Yeah. The last thing that I really, really liked were the B&G electronics. And this isn't particular to the Sea Wind, but the B&G electronics, the displays, the output is absolutely beautiful. Now we have Raymarine on Clarity and it, it works and it works really well and it's pretty easy to set up, but the B&G stuff is much more tailored for sailing. Category number two, these are the very, very nice aspects that we noticed about the Sea Wind 1260. Some of these actually Clarity has. So the first one on that list that I would say I noticed was the very high bridge deck clearance. So that's gonna be really nice for sailing in, in seas where you could have slapping and that'll be nice and comfortable for you. Yeah, some folks make a bigger deal out of bridge deck clearance than others. And really what you're talking about is not seaworthiness, it's noise. And with boats that are lower down to the water, if you're going upwind, and sometimes with a quartering sea, you can get the waves that really bounce between the hulls and it can make a ton of noise. In fact, it can really shake the entire boat in some designs. This boat was nice and high up off the water. I would say the bridge deck clearance was very similar to what we've got on Clarity. And really, she doesn't make that much noise unless the waves are really, really big. Yeah. Another aspect that we thought was really cool about the Sea Wind 1260 was docking is much easier because you have the dual helms. Basically, three or maybe four types of helm configurations on modern cruising catamarans. One would be a 
flybridge sort of thing like we've got on Clarity. It's not really a true flybridge or a cockpit that's all the way up on top of the boat. Another way of arranging the helms and the steering on a catamaran would be outboard, like you find on boats like Katana and the uh, Nautitech, the Open 46 and the Open 40 boats. Those helms are at the sterns of each hull. Another configuration would be a bulkhead mounted steering station. That's very common on boats like a Privilege, the older Voyage boats, where you've got a single helm, it's lower down, and then you've got the dual helm configuration like you've got on the Sea Wind. Uh, some of the old Ultramares are the same way. This has got some pluses and some minuses as we're gonna talk about, but in the docking category, especially when you use their optional dual throttle controls where you can control the engines on both sides of the boat. If you're tying up to starboard, you're on that starboard helm. If you're tying up to port, you're over on the port helm. With some of the flybridge type helm arrangements like we've got on Clarity, you can see all the way around, but you're further from some parts of the boat. This isn't unique to the sea wind, but we do really like the self-tacking jib. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's like a main sheet traveler, but for the head sail. Typically this track is right in front of the mast and that lead can be rotated across the boat so that the leech of the jib, the head sail, can be controlled a lot easier. Another side benefit is that when you go to tack the boat, there's nothing really to do. It's a great feature. Another thing we liked about the 1260 was the high aspect rig. Yeah, what this means is that the sails are taller compared to how wide they are. Um, some cruising boats have, I guess you just say, lower aspect rigs. And high aspect rigs are much better and much more efficient, especially in lighter winds. So I would expect that this boat is gonna do really, really well in that seven to 12 knot range. It's really gonna be able to capture the wind and it's gonna be very efficient. We also really like the size to the weight ratio. It's not really heavy, but it's also not really light. Yes, it fits in a nice middle ground. This is not a super duper high performance boat like an Outremer, but it's also not a slug that weighs a whole bunch. And I'm not gonna call out any <laughs> brands. You know who we're talking about. So this boat could fit in the middle in terms of comfort and how much load you can put on board. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to get out into the ocean and really test out how this boat handles in big seas, but we're expecting that it's not going to be the lightest, bounciest ride in the world, and it's also not going to be the heaviest, slowest, and most comfortable. Somewhere in between, and for the experienced sailor especially, this can be a good spot to be. So the third category is the we're not quite sure how we feel about it, <laughs> kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, these are things that really we would need more time on board and would really need to do some miles on the boat to thoroughly evaluate and we could see how these could be benefits and some could be uh, not so great but we really can't make a judgment with just our cursory four-hour sail yeah. out there on this boat first one is openness second one the lounge area the cockpit area and the third thing is the dual helms Let's talk about openness, first of all. When you've got a boat that's somewhat on the smaller end of the cruising range, and 41 feet is on the smaller end of the cruising range, you need to make design compromises that allow for better entertaining. You need to open up the spaces a bit more. And we've seen that design trend over the last several years. It used to be that you just had kind of a sliding patio door, like on our boat, and now several designs have incorporated, I guess what you'd say is much more of a garage door. And Rob demonstrated this for us, and to me, it really looks ingenious. You've got the salon, then you've got the cockpit. And you've really got three different configurations. You can have all three doors, all three panels open, or you can have just one open, depending on what the weather is. But when it's all open, it's like a dance party floor in there. <laughs> you got tons and tons of room. And as you saw from the video just now, it didn't take Rob hardly any time to open this thing up and close it back down. So obviously when you're at anchor and it's all open, you have got a very large entertaining area for a 41 footer. So that of course is fantastic. 
Let's talk about the potential downside of having such an open design. So let's start with the cockpit. So on Clarity, for example, we can seat eight people comfortably for dinner, maybe even 10. And four people all at once can be laying out practically with their legs out and very, very comfortable. It's not a super fair comparison because Clarity is 46 feet and the 1260 is 41 feet. But there is definitely room in the cockpit that could be utilized for lounging that can't really be utilized because of the steering stations for yeah. one and also the barbecue area and I don't remember what was on the other I side. I think it was a fish cleaning area. There was a sink, yeah. They did a fantastic job mm -hmm. with the design of this boat, but I, you would have a hard time entertaining more than another couple or maybe two other couples on this boat. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Another downside about the openness with those forward opening hatches with the spray and the salt that you're gonna have more salt in your boat just by function of having all of those windows and doors open. Yeah, and we're not necessarily talking about sea spray or mist that you can actually see in the air. What happens with boats is just because we're right on the ocean there's salt particles just that are airborne and that will eventually over time get onto basically every surface of the boat even if we're super careful on clarity it's uh, maybe a week or so before your feet start sticking to the floor because of the salt that's just migrated in through hatches and uh, in through the big doorway so i guess we don't really know what this would be like on the sea wind 1260 because of the large opening front ports and then the huge garage door and back, you're gonna have a lot of air circulating. You may be cleaning a little bit more and have more salt on your gear inside the boat. This boat had very nice interior cushion fabric. And while it's very nice, they're probably gonna soak up some of that salt. So one thing you could do is reupholster it with a Naga Soft, something that you could easily wipe up the salt. Yeah, the Naga Soft products, you know, you, you do sweat a little bit more on them and that's maybe a little bit gross, but cleaning them is so easy. I mean, it's just a few sp sprays from the Simple Green, wipe it off and it's all clean. The dual helms. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the preconceived notions that I had coming on to this boat that I would not like this at all. We were skeptical about these dual helms with the inside view, but I get it, this totally works. Lots of visibility, 360 view all the way around from inside. We are elevated helm snobs, if you will. On Clarity, all the lines, except for the main halyard, are led to our cockpit, which is raised above the main entertaining area. It's big enough so that three people can sit abreast, and the two of us often will sit up there and just lounge and talk while we're underway. And the dual helms on this boat neither helm is really big enough or cozy enough that you would sit there together and <laughs> sail. Aww. I was really skeptical about the visibility on the Seawind 1260. Yeah, the helms are mounted just aft of the main bulkhead and the opening doorway to the salon. So you're peeking around the corner a little bit to look around the side of the boat and to look above the coach roof to get a view of the sails. I was also a bit skeptical about the view forward, but once we were on board, mm -hmm. it was clear that at least seeing forward was not a problem. No. They, they solved it in two ways. First of all, those very large forward windows, and then? And then the windows that are right in front of the helm come down electrically that make visibility really quite good. Another benefit of the dual helms that are mounted right at the bulkheads is this boat is gorgeous. The lines are super sexy, super streamlined. You don't have any structures that are popping up above the coach roof. So it just looks like a very, very sleek machine. Aesthetically, I give this boat very high marks. I would also say with the helms right there in the cockpit, you are a part of the action of whatever's going on in the salon and the cockpit, and that's pretty cool. On a boat like Clarity, you've got the helm position where everything can be controlled, and then you've got an entertaining area that's separate. I would definitely say this is a sailor's boat and the sailing aspect is right there in the entertaining area and not separate. I was definitely skeptical before we got onto the Sea Wind 
And now that we spent some time on board, I definitely think this is something I can get used to. There's gonna be drawbacks to each one of these helm configurations, but I think the compromises they've made are good ones. The fourth category are things that we don't really like, but we probably could learn to get used to it and live, and live with it. We're complainers. And plus, we're just a little jealous. <laughs> First one, I would say, is the galley down. This is a big issue for a lot of folks. They say, you know what? I don't want a galley down. And I gotta say, I still agree with that. Having the galley on the main level means that you're cooking and hanging out with everybody else and you're not downstairs. That said, because I agree with that, the Sea Wind did a really nice job of having some visibility from the galley into the salon. There's great windows and the ventilation is awesome down there. I call them the cannon ports because they look like the ports that would be on the side of, a, of an old pirate ship. This gives us great ventilation and that's really important every time I try and cook something. And we haven't really talked about it, but the craftsmanship and the build quality on this boat is really, really high. So in and around the galley, you can see that the joinery is very, very tight. It's very ergonomic and it really just makes sense. And also I loved how the refrigerator was up at the eye level <laughs> side so you could easily see what's in your fridge. And then they had the huge freezer inside the cabinet. And to give a little plus to the galley down configuration, once you take all of the galley out of the main salon, the main salon is much, much bigger. So you've got more options to spread out and get comfortable. Sea wind catamarans popped up on our radar when we visited the Miami Boat Show and got a peek around a Sea Wind 1600. All the lines are lead underneath the decks. It's got a really cool contraption for the dagger boards. This boat is maybe an older design and isn't quite so clean. So the lines on the deck, on the side decks, are actually taking up most of the side deck. So you kind of have to walk on them and that's not very comfortable on your feet. Organizing your lines right on the side and behind the helm gets to be a little bit difficult. It's hard to keep the lines clean. The clutches, everything works very, very well. It was also super nice to be on a boat where the lines weren't as big. I mean, I was controlling the spinnaker without even using a winch handle, and that's another benefit to a boat this size. You get up to a boat size of clarity, yeah, you better have winch handles and maybe even powered winches, especially if the boat's any bigger. Overall, I would say the controllability of this boat and the ease of sail handling was very, very good. Obviously, we love the boat, so we're kind of splitting hairs here. So on that note, I'm gonna go with the split trampoline was not something I loved, but I'm sure I could learn to live with it. On Clarity, we've got one single large trampoline because the anchor actually deploys from the forward end of the bridge deck instead of the bow. There's a lot of downsides to that, but once you lead the anchor and the anchor road up to the bow, you've got uh, a bit more weight up in the bows as well. And the last thing, we're kind of Luddites here. We've been at this a while and all this newfangled technology is just going right over our heads. Now, seriously, there's a bit of automation in the electrical system of the Seawind 1260. Now, this is optional equipment. This isn't the standard equipment. Now, I'm sure it works great. I'm sure it works flawless. In fact, to be able to use a little key fob and turn off the master um, circuit breaker on your boat is pretty darn slick. But as a guy who has been tail up in the electrical uh, room, more than once and trying to diagnose some sort of thing that isn't working out right, it makes me just a little bit nervous to have something that's more or less a closed box system. I guess I'd probably have to learn a lot more about this. And really, if I had an option, I would go with the simple old school breakers and fuses. A lot easier to troubleshoot that stuff than just some screen that says yes and no. We saved the worst for last. There are two major deal killers, the only two with this boat. Yes, and they probably have as much to do with us <laughs> as they do with the boat. We absolutely love the Sea Wind 1260. We love the Sea Wind 1600. This is a boat that I wouldn't hesitate buying for a second. The problem is that little detail is skipped over. 
hesitate in buying. First of all, this boat costs a little less than double what it costs to get into Clarity. So at 600, what'd you say, six and a quarter? 597 for this boat. Um, yeah, 410 base. With a cruising the, chute and all the goodies? Everything, and that's landed. Uh, so yeah, you're, this boat before commissioning, before shipping was 535 well equipped. Okay. So we would probably have to work a lot longer to save up the money for a boat like this. And the last deal killer is that it would take too long to get a new one. <laughs> The word has gotten out. Sea Wind makes a fantastic boat and a lot of people want them. The Sea Wind 1370, I believe, hasn't even been built and I believe they're booked out two or three years, something like that. So for us, in our situation, our scenario, could we have the patience to wait? I gotta say, probably not. We would probably go for a boat that was ready to go right now. But maybe we just need to talk to Rob and Scott, and see if we can work something out. Yeah. <laughs> this is AO uh, that's coming in, and as part of what we do with our clients is we train them on how to handle their boats. And uh, so right now we're giving them a docking lesson, as you can see. They won't leave until we are comfortable with their capabilities, and uh, if they want more time aboard with us, we'll spend as much as they want. So we want them to be happy with the boat. Good, so we call this lesson number one. Absolutely. I'll take hole number 725. You got it. <laughs> yes, Rob and Scott are great guys. Highly recommend them as brokers out of Seattle. Well, thanks everybody for watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode and our little cave from the Oregon coast. <laughs> Huge thank you to our patrons. Really appreciate the financial support. But thanks to everybody. Thanks for spending some time with us. And thanks to our consulting clients for having a lot of fun meeting you. If you didn't know, we have a podcast called Under the Sheets with Theo Kellys. You can get a little bit more behind the scenes information and see what we're doing when we're not talking about folks. Episode every Thursday along with our videos. Talk to you then. Bye-bye.